welcome to my suddenly single surviving to your thriving webinar um, it's great to have you here and let me go through slowly but surely and please feel free to interact or join in or ask questions but in this webinar what I hope you'll get will be to understand the seven stages that you'll go through during the divorce process because it is a process it's not an event I hope that you'll learn positive ways to support your children through this stressful transition so that they feel nurtured, supported and heard through the breakup. And we're going to be looking at creating, just briefly, not in huge depth, but certainly giving you an idea about how to create your personal parenting plan so you have more clarity, more direction and more confidence in your next steps. So. Vicky, tell me, how are you feeling right at this moment? Where are you sort of in the process? And what are your kind of main feelings? If you'd like to share with us, that'd be great. Okay, Vicky, hopefully you can let us know in the group chat that. Okay, well, perhaps, you know, it, it is a very personal journey. And so what I'll do is I'll carry on. And if you feel that you'd like to share, please feel free to. But it's just a moment really in any event to just everyone that's watching the webinar to pause to ponder, just to sort of get out into the open how you're feeling at the moment. Now, as I always say, pro um, divorce is a process, not an event. And I want you to remember that because I think it's very important that you will go through lots and lots of feelings. You will go through feeling one step forward and one step back, sometimes if not three steps forward and five steps back. So remember that divorce is a process, not an event. And, you know, healing from a major life change like a divorce is not easy and it's not quick. And again, it's not linear. Because, you know, going through a divorce is really a real difficult challenge for everybody, mostly. And I always say that it's not like healing from a broken arm, where it will take more or less six weeks and then you're better and you're fine and you're ready to carry on. A divorce can take as long as it takes emotionally because it is your journey. But it also, it takes what I call doing the work around yourself. because. You need to take some time to become reflective and self-aware and to take responsibility for your part in the breakup while also learning eventually to forgive yourself as well as your partner. Because, of course, you know, it's a very sad event in many ways, but there are two people involved in the process. Now, lots of people go through what I call the crazy time. Uh, remember, though, that your children are watching and listening and learning from you all the time. So I want you to ponder, perhaps, that you are teaching them the blueprint for love. And what are they learning from, from this experience? Because some people go through what I call a crazy time. Some people drink too much. Some smoke too much. Some people eat too much or don't eat at all. Some sleep around. Some retreat into a shell and don't go out at all. And of course, some people lash out in anger. And some people jump into other relationships too quickly. And then they tend to repeat their patterns all over again, simply with new partners. So it's important to interpret the stages just as a rough guide and to recognize where you are in the process generally, because it can help you feel better. So if you're going through the crazy time, don't beat yourself up and be unkind to yourself, but notice perhaps what you might be doing, which is maybe drinking too much or whatever it might be. And then think about that and think about how else you can get some support that will nurture you and help you through this very challenging time. And as I say, I want you to be kind to yourself because it's important that you look after yourself during this time. And there is no need for progression 
from one stage to the next, or a defining moment, actually. And reality, there are lots of, as I said before, lots of five steps forward and three steps back type moments. So be prepared for that. And you can go through the stages in a linear fashion, but actually, because life is messy and we are you know, emotional beings, you can go through them in any order. Um, so, you know, don't beat yourself up if you seem to have made progress and then you find yourself you know, back at square one. Be kind to yourself. Look after yourself first so you can then take care of your kids. A bit like the analogy when you're in an aeroplane and if there was turbulence or anything horrible was going to happen, they give you the oxygen mask first because you need to take care of yourself first before you can take care of your children. So don't feel guilty about nurturing yourself, taking care of yourself, because actually in the long term, that is far better for your children. Now, I based my seven stages of going through a divorce on the st stages of grief uh, studied by Kubler-Ross, the model uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross worked with the, with the dying and people who were going through great illnesses. And I've based my model basically on some of these things like shock, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, testing, and acceptance. So let's take a look at how those work, which I feel uh, in recovering from a divorce. First of all, a lot of the time, and the reason I know about all these things is because I went through this harrowing experience myself. So I'm speaking from first-hand experience about five years ago. So the first thing you get is utter shock in nine times out of ten. You'll probably react to learning of the divorce with numbed disbelief. You may deny the reality of the divorce at some level too in, in order to avoid the pain that it feels, you know, and it gives you. Because shock almost provides you with the emotional protection from being too overwhelmed all at once if you discover something pretty, you know, challenging like this. And it may last for many weeks and some people it lasts for a few months. Then you have pain and guilt because as the shock wears off, it's replaced with the suffering of sort of unbelievable pain. Uh, again, this is all dependent on whether this has happened to you or whether you've instigated it. My approach from this angle is it's sort of something that may have happened that came out of the blue to you, or you knew was coming for a few years, but you weren't quite sure of when it was going to happen. And I know that it's excruciating and sometimes almost unbearable, it is important that you experience the pain fully and don't hide it or avoid it or escape it with alcohol or drugs. Now, a lot of people I work with do experience guilty feelings or remorse over things that they did or they didn't do in their relationship or with their partner. And at this stage, life really can feel very chaotic and scary during this phase. And I do remember this myself very clearly. And you may cry quite a lot, but that's quite healthy, really, to let it out. Let your emotions out in a healthy way and in a healthy place and not in front of your children. Then you move on to stage three, which is anger and bargaining. And of course, this is only a guide. You may go through these in very different order. There's no right or wrong way, but you will recognize some of these emotions as you go through. And stage three is where frustration can give way to anger. And you may lash out and become incandescently angry. And you may lay sort of blame on somebody else. Because that's quite easy to blame other people all the time. Um, it's really important, I think, at this stage to talk, perhaps, to a professional or a very good long-term friend who really cares for you to help you control this. Because, you know, this can cause permanent damage to your relationships with your children or with your ex or with your, you know, your other members of your family. And obviously, you know, you may blame your ex-partner, but as I say, this can really damage relationships with your mum, your sister or your friends or whoever. So it's just noticing where you are in the process and doing something healthy with that anger, really. Go for a run, hit a pillow or have a good moan with a friend that keeps your information safe. Now, this is a time to release those strong bottled up emotions. So look for a safe place to do that, as I say, that's healthy. I mean, you may rail against fate, questioning why me. 
You may also try to bargain in vain with the powers that be, whether it's, you know, the universe or God or whoever you believe in, to help you out of this despair. I've heard many people say, oh, you know, I've said to, to the universe, you know, I'll never drink or overspend or shout again if you just bring him back or you just bring her back. Um, so the next stage from that is that you may find you go into depression. Now, I'm not talking about long-term depression. I'm, you know, a great feeling of sadness and feeling low. And it's a period of reflection and actually loneliness because it is a very difficult, challenging time. Um, all your dreams, all your hopes, all your expectations for your life perhaps have been challenged and changed Perhaps it wasn't for your reason. You didn't anticipate this. You didn't plan it. You didn't want it. So the secret here is to focus all your energy, not on fighting the old, but eventually trying to get on with building the new. So this is an interesting period because this is when your friends think, actually, that you should be getting on with your life. They think, well, You've come around numerous times with bottles of wine. I've listened to you over coffee, you know, for hours, and I am your friend and I really care about you. Um, but, you know, you know, isn't it time you kind of got back? It's a difficult time for you, really, because this is a normal stage of grief. So don't be sort of talked out of it by well-meaning outsiders. Uh, encouragement from others is not always helpful during this stage of grieving. But be mindful if this depression or this feeling of sadness is lasting too long. My advice then is to go and talk to somebody. I know if you go to the doctors, you tend to get antidepressants, which is, I'm not hugely in favour as the first thing to do. Try and get some talking, counselling or therapy or talk to a coach like myself. So to help you then plan your positive next steps. So during this time, you finally realise the true magnitude of your loss. And it is quite depressing, perhaps. And you can isolate yourself on purpose. You can reflect on things that you did with your loved one. Certainly birthdays and Christmases and anniversaries, those first ones throughout that first year are pretty challenging. And you do focus on the memories of the past. And sometimes you look back with rose-colored spectacles on some of the events. And then you may feel a sense of emptiness and despair. And all of these emotions are perfectly normal. But then you will come, if you give yourself time, you will come to stage five, which I think is turning the corner. And it's when you have the courage to perhaps let go of what you can't change. And that's quite important, really, to ponder that for a couple of minutes. Because as you begin to adjust to life without your partner, life does become a little calmer. And it does become a little more organized. Your physical symptoms lessen and your sort of depression begins to lift slightly. And then it's the stage six, which is the rebuilding and the working through. Now, as you become more functional, your mind starts working again and you'll find yourself seeking realistic new solutions to problems posed with life without your partner. And you will start to work on practical and financial problems and reconstructing yourself and your life without him or her. But this takes time. So be patient and be kind to yourself as you begin to rebuild. And then eventually, and as I say, there's not an exact science, but eventually you come to stage seven, which is acceptance of the situation you get used to it in fact there are aspects of it that you really enjoy whatever it may be you may have more sense of freedom to go and do what you want eat what you like not watch football if you don't want to all sorts of interesting things that you begin to accept and enjoy and it, you turn into the hopeful phase what I call the phoenix stage so during this the last of the seven stages in this divorce module that I've created you Learn to accept and deal with the reality of your situation. And I always tell my clients that acceptance doesn't necessarily mean instant happiness. You've got to be realistic, given the pain and the turmoil of, you know, for example, I had to leave my beautiful uh, Tudor farmhouse and move into a different house or you move into a flat or you move area or you have to change jobs or go back to work, all these different things that happen. But you can return slowly 
to the carefree, untroubled you that did exist before this, you know, tragedy or, or difficult situation. You know, we need to reframe that perhaps as not a tragedy, but certainly this major life change. And then you will start to look forward and actually plan things for the future. And eventually, hopefully, you will be able to think about your ex without so much pain, sadness and anger because you've worked through the emotions. And that's when I suggest, you know, that's why it's important to have someone to go through the process with, helping you through the different stages so you don't get stuck. Because I, I remember meeting somebody, a client of mine, who had been divorced five years but was stuck in anger. And it seemed a tremendous waste of his own life to be stuck in anger with his ex because he couldn't change things and he couldn't go back and he couldn't seem to move forward. But together I helped him move on and got him through into the, the phoenix stage. Now I want you to remember that life being different doesn't necessarily mean that life will never be happy and fulfilling again. Finally and gradually you do make it through the seven stages of divorce and whilst life will never be quite the same, I think it helps to realise that life being different doesn't necessarily mean that life will never be happy or fulfilling again. Yes, it's changed, but then so have you. Don't stay, as I say, stuck in anger, in bitterness, in resentment. Get the help that you need to move through the process and come out of it a phoenix. Here again is a sort of another poster of those stages of the grief or divorce process. As you can see, a bit like spaghetti, it's all over the place to start with, and you go backwards and forwards between all of these stages at different, you know, different times. Um, but eventually, you do come through that process. So I hope seeing that helps you see that it is a stage and it's a cycle. So now, I think it's time to do three important things. I want you to take stock, take charge, so that you're ready to take off. Here are some questions to ponder. Perhaps you could think about where you are in the process, having learned those seven stages. What do you need to do to feel back in control? And the good thing about having this as a webinar on my membership site is you can go back over this time and time again with a piece of paper and a pen to notice and write down if I were you, when you've got plenty of time, take the time to really answer these questions properly. What area is the most important to focus on just for this week? I think that's important sometimes just to come back into the present. Another angle is to sometimes take yourself right out into the future if you're negotiating in divorce um, proceedings to actually look at what is it you're ultimately, you know, do you want to get out of the divorce process? And I was very clear. I had written down three or four key things that I really wanted to get out of it. And over time, you do negotiate. Of course, you have to compromise. But hopefully then you do walk towards this brighter future that you want. And with one of my clients recently, she wanted a cottage uh, you know, in Wiltshire. So she took a picture of Zoopla and she pinned it up in the kitchen. And that's where she kept focusing on where she was trying to get to. But sometimes it's quite handy to come back into the absolute present and look at what you need to do just this week or just this morning or just today to get yourself organized. But one of the key things I do talk about and I feel is very important is to take action because there's no good keeping it in your head or keeping it on paper. You do need to take some form of action to make some of these things happen. So what action steps do you need to take just for this week to move yourself forward? Not a very good poster, I'm afraid, not very clear. But one to ponder, children who feel confident in the love of both of their parents adjust more quickly and easily to divorce and they have better self-esteem. So make sure your children know that you love them no matter what. Now let's look at helping children feel nurtured, supported and heard through the divorce and separation and breakup process. Now, divorce is stressful for parents and children alike. And although 
reactions that they'll depend on your child's age, their temperament, of course, and their personality, and the circumstances, of course, that you will find yourself in surrounding the split. If it's very acrimonious, or you need to get away because it's violent, or whatever it might be, these will all have a bearing on how your children feel. Now, many children feel sad, of course, devastated sometimes, frustrated, angry, and anxious. And it's not uncommon for them to begin to become naughty at home or naughty at school because of those feelings. So be patient with them. Fortunately, you can help your children during this time of change by consciously minimizing the tension that this situation creates. So although it's difficult when you're dealing with your ex, do try and minimize the tension if you can, certainly in front of the children, because that will help them. And be patient with them and with yourself and with everyone while everyone adjusts to the new situation. Do try and respond openly and honestly to your children's concerns, their worries, their questions. And if you need to, have a look at that article there because uh, that will give you some real pointers about helping your children feel nurtured, supported and heard. I've got over 160 articles that I've written about divorce on my blog. So do go and have a look through my section on divorce. You'll find that there are many, many helpful articles there to help you and your children. So we haven't got time to go through that, but do check out those articles. But here are some of the important things that children need to hear from you at this time. They need reassurance. If you're going through divorce, the most important thing you can give your children is reassurance. Now, you know, the world is upside down at times, so don't give them false promises, but do reassure them and let them know that they need to know that everything will be okay. And secondly, that you and their other parents still love them very much. So one of the things you can do is draw a circle and put some spokes in it like a, a bicycle wheel and write down some key things that you know that you can definitely guarantee. Like they'll stay at the same school. They'll still play with Emily or Peter or whoever their best friend is. They'll still go to clubs. Whatever those things are that you can at the moment guarantee for them, that will give them reassurance about some of the things that will stay the same. Lots of children feel in some way to blame for your breakup. So this is one of the crucial, crucial messages for me tonight from this webinar, is that your children need to know that they are not to blame for your breakup. I've had so many kids that I've worked with through the divorce process, through the family, you know, older kiddies, um, worry that you know they didn't if they got better grades at school if they hadn't been caught out you know smoking that everything would have been all right younger children worry that if they hadn't climbed into you know their children you know, mum and dad's bed um, you know that, that they'd still be together um, Vicky you're 14 months into a separation at the moment and you've got two children one who's 10 and one who's 19 and you're feeling a little bit lost I can really understand that, Vicky. That feeling of, you know, the carpet has been pulled from your feet. Um, so the main thing is to make sure that you feel you've got a good friend or you've got a good pal who you can go and talk with and let out your emotions and have a good cry or have a good slag off uh, in a safe place uh, and try and not go round in circles. Try and make sure that you have a sense of where you're trying to get to. Uh, that is something that I found to be helpful because it is a real feeling of, you know, loss and, and confusion. Um, so I hope by finding someone that you can trust and you can chat to to support you and help move you through it while you will go through all these feelings, but you will come out of it stronger in the end. So. Moving back to reassurance, um, do make sure that your kids, whether they're, you know, however old they are, again, don't confide in your children. I know you say that you've got a 19-year-old. There's a danger also that you confide too much, uh, not you, but generally a lot of people, um, you know, they sometimes confide too much in their kids. And 
they still need you to be their parent, not their friend. Don't go into too much detail. Keep some of the things that you say on a more general, even keel. Because, um, you know, children don't need to know some of these things. I think you still need to be their parent, not their friend. Uh, try and reassure everybody, no matter how old they are, that you will always be part of a family. Because family is forever. But instead of being a family in one home, they'll have two homes to spend time in. So, you know, children do adapt. As I say, it's, um, it's not the divorce um, that causes children distress. It's the level of conflict they experience. I was on um, Eamon Holmes's show on talk radio yesterday. We were talking about divorce and trying to go through it, you know, with dignity and respect. And I think it's very important that children understand that it's the level of conflict that, between you that can damage them, not the actual act. If you handle it well, you take your time, everyone can adjust to it, and children will be okay. Encourage them to talk. That's one of the key things. Whether they're 19 or they're 4 or they're 5 or they're 10, however old they are, it's important for children to feel heard. Uh, I remember when I was teaching, there was th three or four children going through a divorce in my class. And I remember we set up a drop-in and chat session for the kids to pop in any time. And one of the things I remember this beautiful little girl, Becky, saying to me is, nobody's listening to me. Now, Becky was eight because I was teaching year four at the time. And so I, you know, if nothing else, I held the space for Becky to feel heard. But it's much better for you to hold the space when you're not too stressed and too tired, to try and talk openly, again, age appropriately, about the situation and encourage them, particularly boys, if I'm honest, to share their feelings. Think about what you want to say beforehand, as the children benefit from hearing similar messages, if, if at all possible, from bro both of you. And make sure that you keep your explanations quite simple and easy to understand. However, many children may not want to talk about the changes at the same time that you want to. So just be sensitive to when they appear open and ready to talk. And remember that it's important not to force them, but to let them know, you know, that you're always around whenever they fancy a chat. And they may talk to you at, you know, unusual times when you're a bit tired or you've gone to bed with a book and some cocoa or something. But that's important for them to feel that they can talk to you at that time. So just make it clear that you're always there for them. Now, this is important. Don't be negative about your former partner in front of your children because that is their dad or that is their mum. And also, they are half of them. You know, we've all got the genes. We've got the personalities. We've got different bits of each other. And so if you start slagging off or being negative about your, you know, your ex, Children feel compromised. They feel stuck in the middle. They feel that, you know, they're not good enough because they'll take that on board. And I know it can be tempting to criticise your partner in front of your kids to get your own back on them or to vent your own anger or your disappointment. But it's not really a good idea because who is this really helping? Because in hindsight, when you come back through this period and you look back in three years' time, you don't want to look back with regret and feel guilty that you handled it badly. You've got to be the grown-up if you can be in this challenging time. And let's face it, if you were all getting on well, you wouldn't be going through a separation or a divorce. So it is important, though, not to criticise your partner. Because as I say, it might make you feel better in the short term, but it's not in the best interest of your children to encourage them to think poorly of their mum or their dad. So do try and take the bigger picture and the long-term view. And imagine looking back on this period in, say, 20 years' time and hearing how your children will describe it because this will really help you focus on getting it right for them. Doing your best. Now, you can't have control over everything that your children see and hear or are told from the other partner or from you or what they experience. But with a more detached, calm mindset, you can all go through this time of change and challenge, I think, with respect and dignity and confidence. For many adults, separation and divorce is one of the most stressful life events you will ever go through as you handle and juggle custody, financial issues, as well as your own emotional roller coaster. 
And often this period of stress can really bring out the worst in people. I know I've worked with many, many couples going through a divorce. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, it tends to boil down to money and, you know, visitation of the children. So I do encourage you to find simple ways to manage your own stress because that is really essential for the entire family. So do you need to, you know, go for a walk, take up kickboxing or whatever it might be for you, get a dog. It's important that your levels of stress are managed because then you will make better decisions and you'll be in a better place for your kids as well. So keep yourself physically and emotionally healthy as possible if you can and try to combat the effects of stress because it really is important that you are in the best possible place, as I've just said, to take care of your family. Right, breather for a moment. I hope that's all making sense. I hope that's helpful. One of the things that we'll look at now is divorce without damage, your parenting plan. I work with families quite a lot around creating a parenting plan. And one simple thing to do is to get a photograph of your kids and put it in the middle of the table. If you go down the route of mediation or collaborative law rather than going to court, which is just so stressful if you go to court and it just costs a fortune. Um, but if you can do divorce without damage, put a picture of the kids in the middle. Because I worked with a client once and we were talking about something and he said whatever he said. And then I said, well, how do you think Ruby will feel about that? And that's all I had to say. And he looked at the picture and went, oh, that's not a good idea, is it? So again, it's important that you have a little look at your parenting plan. So let's have a, a brief look at how this works. Um, there is no magic formula, let's be honest. Um, your marriage may be over, but your family is not. So it's important that we look at ways to help you through. Uh, I'm very practical about going through this now. This is where we get practical. We've looked at some of your emotional things, and now let's get practical. Because a parenting plan will help you think through the numerous issues. Because I believe the more you get detailed, the less misunderstanding there is. And that really, really will help relating to co-parenting from your, your kids from now on. Because the co-parenting plan or the parenting plan is designed to get those conversations started. And we've got to try and do it without anger or misunderstanding. You've got to go into business mode on this, actually. Park up the fact that you may be married to this person for five years, 10 years, 20 years, because you've got to park this up now and you've got to go into a business sort of mindset. And you've got to be flexible as your children mature and grow up, become more independent. And of course, this needs to be adaptable so that it actually works for your family. Now, there's no magic formula because one size doesn't fit all, as you and your family have your own style, your own rhythm and your own traditions. And of course, you're navigating the very choppy waters of change. So of course, it's all rather new. But one thing is for sure, by creating your parenting plan, you are reducing the stress to your children and creating a tool to help you co-parent. So as I've said, I want you to uh, you know, take an attitude of respect and dignity and go into business mode. So respect, I think, is the key energy of any happy family, regardless of whether you're going through divorce or not. But as I said, put it aside, if you can, your differences and put the best interests of your kids at the heart of the process because I think this is a blueprint the success, the harmony, and happiness for your children going forward. As I've said, get a photo of your kids and put it in the middle of the table, because I think it really helps you to focus. Now, these questions are organized by common issues that you and your children's other parent are likely to address. This is just a broad brush stroke, really. When I work with my clients, of course, we go into far more detail. So the issues for this parenting plan are where they're going to live, all about the money, what happens in school holidays and holidays and Christmases and birthdays. Again, these special occasions we need to think about them so that there's no room for misunderstanding or anger or whatever, frustration. And extracurricular activities on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays. And perhaps the spiritual life around, you know, going to mosque or church or, or going to um, whatever you, you do for spiritual practice. Then we'll look at medical and dental. Now, those things, this will all be up on the website uh, in my membership 
So you can go back through this if you need to take notes and start writing and drawing up your own plan. And of course, there are loads of miscellaneous items too. So use this model to prepare yourself for a discussion also with your child's other parent or your lawyer. Now, if a question doesn't apply to your situation, just simply skip over it and move on to the next question. But this is just an example of some of the common questions that come up that need addressing when I'm working with families. So where will your children live? Do you believe your children should live primarily with you or with your other partner? Or lots of parents I work with, that takes a bit of juggling to start with, but you actually share the children through the course of the whole week. And then you've got to look at when I was working recently with a family, they really wanted to co-parent properly, but there was changeover times on a Wednesday. And we were negotiating whether it was four o'clock or six o'clock when someone had to come back from work. But you really can do this well. You really can do it properly if you want to. Uh, you can do it however you want to do it. But do ponder it. And of course, you've got to negotiate for it. And you've got to be flexible and tolerant if you can be. So if your children were to live with you, what efforts would you make to ensure that they spend time with and have a meaningful relationship with their other parent? Now, lots of parents I work with, because it's all a bit harrowing and they're very angry, they say, well, I don't want him to see them or she, I don't want her to spend time with them. But this is not really a good thing for the long-term well-being of your children. They need both of you in their lives, if at all possible. So do ponder that. Children really do need both parents. You'll have to look at financial issues. How will you share the cost of supporting your kids? You need to talk about that. The more planned you can be before you sit down with a lawyer, the better it can be. Do you need to speak to a lawyer or a financial advisor? I do advise getting advice. A lot of lawyers nowadays have a fixed fee. And, you know, I don't recommend anyone in particular, but you can go and uh, look at resolution to get all sorts of, that's a great website where you can have all sorts of access to legal advice. Because sometimes you do need to make sure that you're going to get what you're entitled to for people's pension or whatever it might be. And I'm not an expert in that. I help people through the emotional roller coaster. So do go and talk to a lawyer or a financial advisor to make sure you get it right. You don't want to be like my friend 15 years later, regretting a decision she made that, you know, means she still has a mortgage at 56. So look at school. Um, do you think they should stay at their current school? The other thing to do as a former deputy head is to go in uh, to the school just to notify them and let them know because your child will be feeling and acting perhaps in a different way at school. So again, talk about how you want to do parents' evenings, how do you want uh, reports to come out, you know, how do they get notifications of what's going on in the school calendar. All these things need to be nitty-gritty worked out. Should both of you have access to school reports, notice of school events and all those sorts of things I've just mentioned. And then do pause to ponder, how will you handle sick days, school break days, snow days, like we've got snow at the moment, how will you handle it? Who takes the children? Who, who takes time off? Who takes them to school? Who picks them up? Because the more you can iron out these things ahead of time, the less anguish and stress you will get when you are negotiating them. Should the two of you consult with each other about major educational decisions? You know, what schools are they going to? What university? Or, you know, what's going to happen? Because you need to talk about some of these decisions. You will do for a number of years. So perhaps if you thought about it ahead of time, it makes it slightly easier. There's holidays, as I've mentioned. Those long summer holidays are very important. Do they go into kids' club? Do you, you know, are you okay for your ex to take them on holiday with his new partner or her new partner? What happens? What are your rules around these sorts of things? Uh, about taking them out of the country or taking them wherever they want to go? You need to talk about these things quite seriously ahead of the time, if it's all possible. Then there's after school activities. How are you going to communicate about those things? WhatsApp. There are lots of apps I know out there as well that help with co-parenting. Who pays for what? Let's talk about it. Let's think about it. You know, is it my turn to pay for the cricket sessions? Or, you know, they're going to do ballet this term. Who pays for that? The other thing to think about, 
uh, is other, rela other relations and friends. You know, children still like to see their grandparents, even though you split up. They still love their granddad and they'd like to spend time with him so, or grandma. So do think about those relationships because those, you know, those people are important and they feel enormous bereavement and sadness if they suddenly don't see the children. So do ponder that and see it from everyone's point of view. But the other thing to ponder is how do you communicate effectively? Because if you can't do it face to face because you're too angry or you just can't stand each other, do you telephone at work, at home? Is it email? Is it WhatsApp? Is there a third party? What sort of co-parenting app perhaps might be helpful? All of these things reduce misunderstanding and therefore reduce anger and resentment and stress. As I say, all the time and you've heard many times don't put your children in the middle and use them as pawns to score points against your ex they visit dad's house don't grill them on what you did and what time you went to bed and what did you eat and what was she like or or the vice versa you know make sure the children don't feel compromised and feel they have to take sides try to be you know more even-handed work together I know it's difficult, but you'll come out of this highly stressful time far less damaged and traumatized if you do try and work together. Now, I created my Talking to Children About Divorce conversational cards because they're a really great place to start. So if you're interested in those, they are available on my website because that's a good place to begin the conversations and think about the questions. Just a pack of 48 questions that get you thinking and the answers then are all, you know, for you and your family. There they are, there. As I've said, it's not divorce that causes the greatest amount of harm to kids. It's the levels of conflict they experience between their parents. Here are all my divorce resources. Talking to children about divorce, common questions children ask about divorce, co-parenting questions too to get you thinking and actually the legal pack is very helpful because it, it's you know getting you prepared before you actually sit down and the clock starts ticking talking to a lawyer so those are all available on my website now this is something i'm very passionate about this is the divorce journal for children that i wrote it's designed to help your children express explore and understand some of the very strong emotions that they may be feeling and to help them through the process for themselves. You can use the divorce journal for kids to just write their emotions and draw their pictures and all the questions I've answered in there without you, or you can use it as a, as a sounding board to kind of say, oh, let's have a look at this together, and it will start conversations for you to join in with, with your kids and listen to how they're feeling as they are going through this process too. They always have a lot to say. So do take a look at my divorce journal for children. I feel it's something of very great importance for children at this time. I have a six-week coaching program supporting you and your family through divorce. It's six weekly 60-minute sessions of an hour with me. But if you join my parenting online club, you can actually have a conversation with me once a month, um, which is only £89.95 per month. That means you join the club and you get a monthly conversation with me for an hour, either here at my practice or over the telephone or over Skype however, or FaceTime, however you would like to do that. So that's a very reasonable way to get the support uh, to help you through this time of challenge and change. Now, if there are any questions, let's have them. And if not, I'm going to just click through to get to the end. This is where you can find me on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and here you can download my free seven stages of recovery from divorce ebook. So if you go through this and click on that link, uh, that's a new ebook that I have created talking all around these seven stages for you to keep. So I do hope that you have found this to be of help to you. Uh, I know it's a very difficult time. I will know that you do come through it stronger, resilient and okay eventually if you get sometimes some help and time is a great healer but I do hope that this webinar has been of some help to you on your journey and if I could be of any help in any other way please feel free to contact me so thank you very much